Friends of Canadian Broadcasting. Please go ahead. You have 15 minutes for your presentation. Monsieur le Président, a uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, thank you for having invited Friends of Canadian Broadcasting to take part in this panel. Your decision has the ability to uh, improve or diminish the choice of Canadians in our broadcasting system, as well as affecting the infrastructure and, in fact, even the country's democracy. These are not light respons uh, responsibilities to be taken lightly. With ACTRA, CEP, Stornoway, and Writers Guild, friends placed on the public domain research we commissioned from Polara, Canada's largest public opinion and marketing research firm, about Canadians' views on deregulating cable and TV uh, distributors. In order to bring the opinions of Canadian subscribers to the hearing, I just want to share a few of these uh, thoughts with you. Can I just interrupt you for one second, Mr. Morrison, just so we understand each other? I have absolutely no problem with you talking about this. You put this in the public domain, etc. Mm -hmm. But I understood from the staff that you wanted to make this part of this proceedings, which, which you can clearly do. Just but to put you at ease, uh, we have no intention of asking you to have this document as part of the proceedings. Um, our legal advice is that you're entitled to consider anything that's in the public domain. This is there. Uh, but. Uh, should you uh, treat it informally and find in your native curiosity the wish to learn what the public thinks about the issues before you, you have every right to read the document. Okay. But let I don't me, expect let me you to finish my sentence. I wouldn't I was expect you to, to put it on the record. You can put it on the record yeah. in your reply submission, but for today it's not on the record. But of course I'm willing yeah. to listen to your comments on it and to educate me as to the, what you found out as a result of your survey. Thank you. So we don't, I don't think we have a, a gap uh, there, Mr. Chair. Uh, but I did lose a minute there. <laughs> you shall have your extra minute. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, two minutes is what the cable guys would want. 82%, uh, 82%, yeah. Mr. Chair, of, of Canadian subscribers feel strongly about uh, Canada's unique values and identity. 87% think that Canadian TV production is important to the economy. 55% believe that the Canadian television production industry will not be able to survive and succeed in an unre unregulated cable and satellite environment. And overwhelmingly, I think this is important, Canadians view television as a cultural trust, not just an economic or business issue. Your commission and the federal government, and not the service providers, are considered the guardians of Canadian culture on TV. Almost 7 in 10 Canadian subscribers place the most trust in the CRTC and the federal government to protect and promote Canadian content on TV. 74% of subscribers believe that less regulation is likely to have a negative impact on Canadian television by reducing choices of Canadian programming. 9 in 10 think that it is important to have regulations and incentives to ensure the continued presence of independently owned Canadian broadcasters on their cable and satellite lineups. Nearly six in ten believe that it would be detrimental to Canadian content to allow cable satellite providers to decide which channels to make available. More than half of Canadian subscribers would support paying three dollars per month on their cable satellite bill <coughs> to protect the Canadian content. Four in ten would pay six dollars and a third would pay as much as $10 monthly. Now, Polara asked a couple of detailed questions on that topic, and just to save time and be respectful of, uh, of, of your uh, late hour, I'm just going to characterize them rather than read them. The first was about four or five bucks per month uh, that would be collected for the purpose of helping uh, the local over-the-air television stations, such as CTV, Global, TVA, uh, City TV, etc. And uh, in that question, Mr. Chair, there was definitely a line that I would say uh, gave the public the notion that this contribution would be, to use your word, your verb, earmarked. Uh, and we found, uh, Palera found, that 50% of subscribers would support such a proposal. The same thing with the National Public Broadcaster, the CBC, Radio Canada, uh, the same earmark, and 57%. Uh, would support that proposal. Very few uh, cable satellite subscribers 
have canceled their subscriptions as a result of past fee increases. Replacing Canadian programming with foreign programming is unpopular in all the main program types. A majority do not trust cable and satellite companies to promote and deliver Canadian channels and content, while Canadian cable and satellite subscribers are satisfied with their price, 58%, program packages, 62 reliability, 83 and picture and sound quality, 90 they do not trust their suppliers to make decisions on programming choices. And finally, Polara found that only 15% of Canadians are aware that your commission is considering proposals to reduce regulation of cable and satellite services. Now, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, our broadcasting system is respected worldwide in large measure because of steps taken by your commission over several decades to ensure the quantity and diversity of Canadian programming. These steps have created a balance among programming undertakings, pay and specialty services, and the broadcasting distribution undertakings, which we're describing as BDUs. I must say, Mr. Chair, when I talk about BDUs out in a public thing, I say that that's CRT speak, you see CRTC speak for uh, cable and uh, satellite. The result is harmony among the interests of all stakeholders resulting in the maximum overall contribution by each sector to the goals of the Broadcasting Act. As we have detailed in three submissions, we're convinced that, should the Commission move forward as outlined in the July 5 public notice and the March 14 Schedule 2, the result will be a reduction in access and in the number of services not BDU affiliated in available hours for Canadian programming and in expenditures on Canadian programming. In other words, a derogation from your responsibilities under the Act. The rules you administer have evolved <clears throat> since the dawn of cable. The Canadian broadcasting system is an ecosystem where each of the components is inextricably linked so that a change in one will affect the others. It is therefore vital to consider their interdependence and its consequences. The BDUs espouse the market forces theme because they are the market force. In our broadcasting system, a reliance on market forces is analogous to the Darwinian notion of letting only the strongest survive. As CTV, CanWest and, and friends have previously noted, real market forces in cable would arrive only if U.S. distributors were licensed to operate in Canada. During the diversity of voices hearing, you heard many times about the predatory practices of BDU negotiations. This highlights the great vulnerability of smaller, independent programming services, despite their substantial contribution to diversity in the system. Based on the preliminary data the Commission provided in advance of this hearing, BDU subscriptions between 2002 and 2007 have increased by 9.4%, from 9.3 to 10.1 million. During the same period, BDU programming revenues increased from 4.2 billion to 6.1 billion, an increase of 44%. Moreover, combined BDU revenue per subscriber has increased from 455 to $600 per annum, an increase of nearly 32%. In the 2006 broadcast year, Average per sub BDU revenue went up 5.4 percent. If Canadian demand for BDU services had been as sensitive as Blackwell and Gloverman preposterously suggest, such a price rise would have caused a subscriber loss of between 300 and 600,000. Instead, subscriptions grew by 7.6 percent per cable, 5.6 percent for DTH for an overall annual increase of 660,000 subscribers, or 7.1% over the previous year. Polara, by the way, found that 41% of subscribers report that they do not have a choice of BDU, and 49% indicate that their service is bundled with telephone or internet services, thereby constraining mobility between services. Some, since basic deregulation of cable in 2002, I'm talking about the basic cable, Rogers and Shaw have increased their basic rates by an astounding 70%. Now, the Broadcasting Act states that 
each broadcasting undertaking shall make maximum use and in no case less than predominant use of Canadian creative and other resources in the creation and presentation of programming. The Commission's public notice and Schedule 2 would open the gate to a significant reduction in the number of Canadian channels offered and a corresponding increase in American services. None of this would increase diversity. However, it could be expected to reduce significantly the amount of foreign programming <clears throat> that would subsequently be available for purchase by Canadian channels, threatening the very existence of the Canadian territorial rights market, which cross-subsidizes Canadian content production. Adopting this watered-down standard could also create a precedent for television programming services to reduce overall CanCon levels from 60 to 50.1 percent. Parliament set preponderant as a rock-bottom expectation, as distinct from the desired maximum. So how is it possible for BDUs to advance the goals of the Act by reducing Canadian services to the lowest expectations? A review of the CRTC's BDU financial database for 2007 broadcasting year indicates that 88% of all affiliation payments by BDUs were made to Canadian pay and specialty services. Non-Canadian services received the balance of 12%, which was still nearly $250 million, up from 200 the year before. If under a proposed 50.1% regime, or 50 plus one regime, affiliation payments to Canadian services were to drop proportionately, this would extract, or could extract, from more than $750 million per annum from the system and ship it south. That's more than a blip in Canada's balance of payments. Canadian subscribers understand this. Polara asked, do you think that allowing cable and satellite providers to choose which Canadian and foreign channels are available or not available to consumers would be good for Canadian viewers and listeners? Yes, 28%. No, 59%. Friends does not consider that Canadian services should receive preferential tiering based solely on when they were licensed. The 5 to 1 linkage rule is essential to ensure a fair and balanced system in which independently owned and unaffiliated services can obtain shelf space and access to viewers alongside the ones in which the major BDUs have a, an ownership position. Commissioner Williams, you'll find yourself uh, quoted in footnote number seven, but I won't read it. Okay. Just look at a graphic of the services offered by SkyVision, an affiliate-dominated system in the UK. Can one really expect that independent services would be carried in the absence of rules? Friends argues not for genre protection per se, but rather for the continuance of clearly defined nature of service descriptions. One of the key elements in the Commission's licensing policy with respect to analog and category one digital services has been defining nature of service obligations that distinguish one channel from another. This process has prevented a mass migration of services towards a homogenized mainstream, thereby fostering the emergence of niche <laughs> services that make an important contribution to diversity. The Commission correctly notes that licensing of additional services has blurred the boundaries, but the current rules still maintain the maximum amount of separation between the services. A legitimate concern might be that in the absence of clear nature of service definitions, channels will have a financial incentive to move towards programming with the greatest audience appeal. To the extent that maximizing audience becomes the key driver of programming decisions, we can expect that the current clusters of niche appeal would dissolve and be replaced by an abundance of programming selected from only the most popular areas with diversity the loser. In such a likely scenario, channels could marginally change from their present form. As a consequence, the overall channel offering would likely be far less eclectic and much more homogenized. Now the vast majority of programming currently aired on services such as USA Network and HBO is already available in Canada on Canadian services. One of the key and lasting consequences of allowing, for example, 
the USA Network or HBO into Canada would be that Canadian rights to this programming would most likely be retained by the USA Network and HBO and no longer be available to Canadian specialty services. This concern pales in comparison with the notion of the Commission abandoning protection of Canadian services from the entry of US services in the same genre. The present policy has enabled programming partnerships that have effectively Canadianized popular US services while ensuring a valuable contribution to spending on and exhibition of Canadian programming. This proposal would cut this critical supply chain. Were genre protection to be discontinued, when the existing partnership agreements expire, Canadian viewers would likely find that existing Canada-US partnerships would wither in favour of direct distribution of the US service by a Canadian BDU. Where a partnership does not exist, and the History Channel is an example, we fear a scenario where the BDU would replace the Canadian channel with the US version, not because of superior programming, but rather because of cost and the prospect of receiving two minutes of new ad avails each hour as part of the carriage agreement. Now, other Schedule II issues, just in bullet form. We favour fee for carriage applied to digital subscribers. Cable community channels should be given access to local advertising. In exchange, we recommend a phased decoupling of cable community channel spending from the 5% CTF contribution and raising the contribution to 7% along the lines of the Canadian Film and Television Production Association's proposals. Cable access to revenue from advertising avails on US services should be permitted, provided that 75% of the net revenue is contributed to the CTF. The basic service should offer a core of programming services at the lowest possible price so that the greatest number of Canadians can have access to the Canadian broadcasting system. Guaranteed access services are so designated because the Commission has determined that their distribution is in the public interest or aligned with public pro policy priorities as expressed in the Act. APTN, French language channels on English language markets, Vision TV are good examples. Popularity and longevity are not appropriate criteria. In the case of large multiple systems operators, financial transparency is in the public interest. BDUs should not be allowed a competitive advantage over pay and specialty services whose financial information is transparent. The Commission's simultaneous substitution policy is integral to the viability of OTA broadcasting and contributes substantially to resources for Canadian programming. BDUs must not be allowed to compete with broadcasters for the acquisition of programming rights. And finally, special rules should be implemented to protect independent television owners defined as those with less than a 20% ownership by major station groups. Merci de nous permettre de présenter notre... Thank you for allowing us to present our perspective, Mr. Chair. You both were here this morning, I trust, when Rogers was talking. And the central theme of Roger, Rogers was that the consumer wants to have total freedom, wants to do what he wants, when he wants, where he wants it. And that really the challenge to us is to make sure that the consumer stays in the Canadian broadcasting system and isn't frustrated by the rules and the, uh, that we put on either broadcasters or BDUs and therefore migrates to another platform, primarily the Internet where he can watch what he wants, uh, how he wants, etc. And they obviously see that as a real threat. And to, to some extent, we see it too. I don't know what the, what the size of the threat is and the imminence of the threat, but it's clearly there. Yet both your submissions seem seems to say the system as we have it is OK or strengthen it, etc. And, and essentially, unless I misunderstood you, completely ignoring this threat which is clearly hanging over us. I wonder whether you would comment on that. I mentioned to you that we've established through a research uh, exercise that 40% of subscribers do not feel they have a choice. 60% perhaps think they do. Um, consumers making the decisions. Um, 
we don't see the proposed situation as being one where the consumers are making the decisions. We, we think essentially three, maybe three and a half, if you include Kojiko, um, Canadian companies uh, are making decisions about what people do get to see and do not get to see. Uh, we see the, the consumer uh, line as without fidelity. Um, the evidence of this uh, crisis is not present in the data we're discussing. If it were, I, I would respond differently. Uh, but the, the prosperity, to put, use a felicitous word, of the cable industry, it, it took me a couple of minutes to read all of the data that uh, was evident of that. Um, the rise of high definition um, and the appetite of that uh, select part of the market for high definition signals is rising faster than bandwidth and signal quality on the internet can possibly uh, compete with it, uh, thereby pushing out. By the way, I'm a skeptic on 2011, okay? But uh, uh, so in sum, I would say back, uh, you mentioned that 15 years ago there was another great hearing. It was called the mother of all hearings by your predecessor, I recall, and I remember being part of it. And I remember that time the cable industry came along with something they called the Death Star. And they somehow used that to persuade your commission that there was a huge danger from American satellites. Uh, I see this uh, theme as being the 2008 version of the, the Death Star. They have a conflict of interest, obviously. It's cheaper to import these foreign signals and offer them for the, it's a, it's a better use of the bandwidth from an economic point of view. It's not uh, something that enhances the goals of the Broadcasting Act. Yes, thank you. Rita? Mr. Morrison, I will move to you and to your, uh, again, I'll start with your written submissions. Uh, your October submissions say that a legitimate fear might be that in the absence of a clear nature of service definitions, channels will move towards programming with the greatest audience appeal. And to the extent that maximizing, maximizing audience becomes the key driver of programming decisions. Could it not be argued that every broadcaster is in the business of maximizing audiences? Why is that such a great fear? Diversity, Diversity is an important value uh, that your commission espouses. Um, the nature of service distinctions of a number of uh, specialty channels uh, ensure that they focus on doing what they what they said they would do rather than moving to something else that might get them larger audiences but is not faithful to their niche. Uh, our concern is that without uh, the requirements of nature of service, I think I addressed this in my remarks today, that uh, you'll get a move in the specialty area towards homogeneity popular, mainstream, the middle of the road, and not the variety and distinctiveness that we enjoy today. Uh, Professor Globerman, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, I, I can't help you on that. No. Pardon me? <laughs> I can't help you on that. Submitted a paper. Wish I'd never heard the name. <laughs> uh, as part of the Shaw submission. Yes. And says, to be sure, increased reliance on market forces will inevitably create the potential for the failure of some programming services. At the same time, it will allow innovative and efficient services to thrive. In simple terms, competition will contribute to Canadians receiving their preferred Canadian and non-Canadian products. Do you just categorically disagree with that statement, or are you saying that we should not allow for the failure of any programming services? They should not fail because they are faithful to the niche service that you have licensed them to perform. But what if they're maintaining that nature of service or being faithful to that nature of service means Canadians don't watch it? Maybe the nature of service was just a bad idea. Well, then. Maybe the nature of service is uh, a bad idea. Maybe it's a good idea. Professor Gloverman cashed a check from Shaw Communications and wrote an opinion. Um, I trust the opinion was felicitous to the people who paid him. I think in large measure that that report is devoid of merit. I, in fact, I was quite un unimpressed with it. And I hope that you would extend to it the skepticism that you rightly show towards everything that comes before you. 
uh, in your written submission and again today, you suggested that a separate set of rules for independently owned specialty services uh, might, I mean, we might, it might be time for us to have these separate rules so that they too can participate in the system and in your written oral submission today you did, um, you did uh, qualify it further with the 20 percent. But are you suggesting that by virtue of independent ownership that these services should have guaranteed access or by, but by virtue of independent ownership, that's it, that, that qualifies them to have a separate set of rules? Um, I imagine when uh, Mr. Fitzan appears before you, he could claim that he had independent ownership. Uh, independent ownership means not affiliated with the BDUs, right? Uh, we're talking about the small providers who are independent from the major uh, station groups. No, I understand. In this, okay? And we defined it for, we suggest, we, we would actually trust your commission to find a better way to define it. We suggested that up to 20% investment by whether it's Richard Sturzberg or Yvonne Fitzan's organization should not disqualify them. We count about eight such services. We're not talking about a huge number. But because of their huge bargaining disadvantage. In fact, even the use of the verb bargain is not an appropriate verb in their relationship with the BDUs. Uh, they need your protection. So even though we are not recommending a, an abandonment of the, the rules that uh, your commission has put together over a, a number of years, we are suggesting that even if you did decide to, what are the verbs, simplify. I mean, what, I'm, I'm looking at uh, notes from the chairman's questioning of Rogers this morning and seeing uh, beside regulation the words complicated, dirigiste, phrases like that. Even if you did decide to try to uh, uh, streamline your rules, you've got to pay, you don't have to do anything. We urge you to pay special attention to those small independent players without your Without the umbrella you hold over their head, they have no means of, uh, of fending for themselves in this multi-billion dollar uh, situation where three Canadians effectively, uh, barring your commission's input, determine whether they succeed or fail. You've set the number at eight. What about the third language services? Should we have special rules for yeah. them? Because aren't they just about no, you're quite in right the up. same boat as those eight individuals? As Alain Pinot says, I stand corrected. <laughs> okay. I was talking about the general uh, services that are broadcasting in the official languages of Canada. I apologize. Okay. So the answer is yes. Include yes. the third language services mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. Uh, again, in your written submission, you don't support the sale of local avails by BDUs. You heard Rogers today say that it would be limited to local advertising only. Does that give you any comfort? Um, or does that allow you to change your opinion on the sale of local avails by BDUs? Uh, in my remarks today, I don't think uh, I, I said that we opposed the sale of local avails by BDUs. Did you hear me say that? I, I read it in your written submission yeah. at paragraph 50. You did, eh? All right. Well, sometimes uh, um, you know, when people say, when, when I'm very tired, I insist on my right to be inconsistent. <laughs> but uh, what we would like you to do is to ensure that where uh, the BDUs gain more revenues from advertising, I'm stating a principle here, we would like you to ensure that a portion of that revenue flows back to the benefit of the system, be that... Uh, a contribution to the Canadian Television Fund or a contribution, a share back to, uh, to, to broadcasters in some way. So uh, it's, not, it's not that we're against their advertising. For example, with the community channels. We're, we're, we're not against them uh, selling advertising locally in the community channels. We would just like to see that in return for that, um, that contribution to the community channels was decoupled from the 5%. So we, we would urge you uh, to keep in mind the principle of ensuring that the money flows back to the objectives that, that you have to uh, espouse. Because in fact, Mr. Morrison, I mean, the reason I asked you whether or not your position would change based on the response today from Rogers saying that they would sell only local ads mm -hmm. is because you say it would have a significant negative impact on Canadian over-the-air and specialty services. They'd be competing for a limited base of advertising with those services. Okay, so you've mitigated your, your position a little bit. 
from your written. Which is the same as the idea of learning, I suppose, Commissioner. Okay. Thank you. I'm at your feet. Um, you also support the elimination of advertising limits on specialty. Uh, you all, I mean, as we know, the over-the-air broadcasters are saying audience fragmentation, our advertising is declining. Is there not a fear that if we do eliminate the limits on advertising on specialty, that we're going to be dumping all this advertising inventory into the market, thereby just exasperating the problems that over-the-air broadcasters have currently, and we're going to depress the, the, the price of advertising rates? There might be. It seems to me that you've... Uh you crossed that bridge when you took your decision about OTA advertising. We do not think that it is appropriate to uh, limit the specialties to a rule that no longer applies to OTA. It's just not equitable. Okay. You, uh, we opposed that, by the way. I understand that. Okay. You understand. Yeah, you understand. You suggest that over the year broadcasters should obtain subscription revenues levied only on digital subscribers. So. Uh, between now and 2011, as long as OTA broadcasters are available on analog, you're saying that you should not collect a fee for carriage? Or are you... Let, me, let me ask you this. Right now... I'll give you a rationale or... or sorry, well, yeah, no, but right now I'm a Rogers subscriber and I, you know, I, I, I am, I'm a digital subscriber and uh, I have, I receive my over-the-air services on a digital box. I still have an analog TV down in the basement. Um, so, does that qualify as, as an over-the-air broadcaster being a digital or not? I, I think you and I would be roped in by the proposal that we are espousing because we would both be Rogers Digital subscribers. The rationale for it, uh, in our opinion, is twofold. One, it is the digital subscribers who, by virtue of the huge numbers of signals they can now receive, are contributing to the fragmentation that is the essence of the problem. And secondly, people uh, who through age or income uh, are hard pressed to spend more than $35 a month on, uh, on their television reception services would at least in the short term uh, be exempted from the cost of this. And uh, we also did some calculations which are subject to uh, revision that indicated that, uh, and it's in our submission that one could raise something in the range. One could raise substantial money from the digital subscribers, leaving alone for the time being the, uh, the analog subscribers. Because they have demonstrated that they are willing to pay more for their in-home entertainment yeah, willing because and, uh, it's the digital, they either bought the digital box or they're renting it or yeah. they've got a PVR. Willing and able, I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you also say that um, you did mention the lower income, often elderly customers purchasing basic services should not be required to bear additional fee increases. Although you are a skeptic on 2011, what happens after that when the to, whole world is digital? They'll have to bear the fee increase unless in your wisdom you find a way to, uh, to, uh, to make it easier for them. Um, one way would be, and I just draw a line between that and the notion that we're proposing um, as, as affordable as possible, a basic package. Uh, we think that that's really important to ensure that the maximum number of people are able effectively to enter the audiovisual system. And what do you think should be included in the basic package? Um, we, we would like a smaller basic package than now exists. Um, we don't have a position exactly on what should be there. We would like you to make it smaller uh, if you can. Um, it would certainly include the public broadcasters. It would include the over-the-air broadcasters. Um, it would be, what's it called? Nine, 9 1H? 9 1H broadcasters. But, uh, but uh, we, we urge you to move in the direction of encouraging it, the, the most affordable. And I, by the way, I'd have no problem you getting back into rate regulation uh, for the most affordable. Uh, no problem whatsoever. Mr. Pino.